Effect of Forgery in a Negotiable Instrument Section 23 Forged Signature When a signature is forged or made without authority of the person whose signature it purports to be, it is wholly inoperative, and no right to retain the instrument, or to give a discharge therefore, or to enforce payment thereof against any party thereto, can be acquired through or under such signature, unless the party against whom it is sought to enforce such right is precluded from setting up the forgery or want of authority. Forgery explained. By forgery is meant the counterfeit making or fraudulent alteration of a writing, and may consist in the signing of another's name or the alteration of an instrument in the name, amount, description of the person and the like, with intent thereby to defraud. The intent to defraud distinguishes forgery from innocent alteration and spoliation. Application of Section 23 1. Two cases. This provision consists of two parts. The first part states the general rule while the second part states the exception to the general rule. It applies only to two cases, a, where the signature on the instrument is affixed by one who does not claim to act as an agent and who has no authority to bind the person whose signature he has forged, and b, where the signature is affixed by one who purports to be an agent but has no authority to bind the alleged principal. 2. Effect of forged signature. In both cases, the signature is wholly inoperative and so no right can be acquired through the forged signature. Payment made through or under such forged signature is ineffectual and does not discharge the instrument. A person whose signature was forged as maker, drawer, payee, or endorsee of a note or check was never a party or never gave his consent to the contract which gave rise to the instrument. Since his signature does not appear in the instrument, he cannot be held liable thereon by anyone. Forgery is, therefore, a real or absolute defense even against a holder in due course. 3. Proof of Forgery Forgery, as any other mechanism of fraud, must be proven clearly and convincingly, and the burden of proof lies on the party alleging forgery. It cannot be presumed. A person who denies issuing a note or check puts into question the genuineness and authenticity of the signature appearing thereon, it is he who has the burden of proving the signature is a forgery. Mere variants of signatures cannot be considered conclusive proof that the same were forged. Examples 1. P makes a promissory note payable to his own order, forging M's signature as maker. The signature is inoperative and, therefore, it did not operate to make M a party to the instrument. M is not liable even to an innocent purchaser for value. 2. X issues a promissory note payable to the order of P. X signs M's name indicating that he signs for and on behalf of M. However, X has no authority to bind M. The signature is also inoperative and M is not liable to any holder. Cases of Forgery in General The cases of forgery may be divided as follows. 1. Forgery of promissory notes which may be subdivided into a. Forgery of an endorsement on the note, and b. Forgery of the maker's signature. 2. Forgery of bills of exchange which may be subdivided into a. Forgery of an endorsement on the bill, and b. Forgery of the drawer's signature, either 1. With acceptance by the drawee, or 2. Without such acceptance but the bill is paid by the drawee. Extent of the effect of forgery. Section 23 does not purport to declare the instrument totally void nor the genuine signatures thereon inoperative. It is only the forged or unauthorized signature that is declared to be inoperative. In other words, rights may still exist and be enforced by virtue of such instrument as to those whose signatures thereto are found to be genuine. A forged endorsement prevents any subsequent party from acquiring any right as against any party whose name appears prior to the forgery. Although rights may exist between and among parties subsequent to the forged endorsement, not one of them can acquire rights against parties prior to the forgery. Such an endorsement cuts off the rights of all subsequent parties as against parties prior to the forgery. However, the law makes an exception to these rules where a party is precluded from setting forgery as a defense. Example. M. Makes a note payable to the order of P. P. Endorses it to A. But then, X obtains possession of the note fraudulently and endorses it to B, by forging A's signature. B endorses to C. Thus, the endorsements are as follows. Pay to, blank, signed by, P. Then made into pay to A, signed by, A, but actually forged by X. Then made into pay to B. Signed by, B. See page 94. 1. C cannot enforce the instrument against M and P because C's rights against them are cut off by the forged signature of A, which is wholly inoperative. C could acquire rights against M or P to the instrument only through the forged signature of A. 
2. Neither can C enforce the note against A, because A's signature is wholly inoperative. A, has no privity with C. Under section 23, C acquired no right to retain, discharge, or enforce payment of the note under the forged signature of A. 3. But C may go against B whose signature is genuine and, therefore, operative. B is a general indorser who warranted to C that the instrument is genuine and was valid and subsisting at the time of B's endorsement. 4. Of course, B or C has a right of recourse against X, the forger. 5. A can recover from M and P because his rights against them were not affected by the forgery. The signatures of M and P are genuine and they are liable to A on their contract. Exceptions to the general rule. There are actually two exceptions to the general rule that no right or title can be acquired to a negotiable instrument through or under a forged or unauthorized signature, namely. 1. If the party against whom it is sought to enforce such right is precluded from setting up the forgery or want of authority, and. 2. Where the forged signature is not necessary to the holder's title in which case the forgery may be disregarded. There is seldom any practical distinction in the negotiable instrument field between a case where there has been no forgery or want of authority and a case where a party against whom it is sought to enforce a right is precluded from setting up the forgery or want of authority. Persons precluded from setting up the defense of forgery. Precluded, as used in section 23, is synonymous with estopped, and does not include ratification or adoption in their strict primary meaning but only when they involve some of the elements of estoppel. 1. Divided into two general classes. Those precluded from setting up the defense of forgery may be divided into two general classes. They are a. Those who by their acts, silence, or negligence, are estopped from setting up the defense of forgery, and b. Those who warrant or admit the genuineness of the signatures in question, namely, 1. Indersers, 2. Acceptors, and 3. Persons negotiating by delivery, 2. Right to recover damages. A party precluded from raising the defense of forgery such as by reason of negligence may still recover damages under the civil code provisions on quasi-delicts. Examples 1. P makes a promissory note payable to his own order, forging M's signature thereto as maker. When P attempts to endorse the note to A, the latter asks M if his signature is genuine and M says it is alright. In this case, M is estopped from setting up that his signature is a forgery. This is an example of estoppel arising from declaration. 2. M, whose name was forged by X, her husband, upon notes also signed by him and given for a loan to him, who failed to inform A, the payee, of the forgery for many months after she discovered it, thus preventing A from taking steps to protect himself against loss was, stopped by her silence from setting up the forgery on the theory, he who is silent when conscience requires him to speak shall be debarred from speaking when conscience requires him to be silent. 3. Where the drawer negligently failed to examine checks returned to him, it was held that he was precluded from holding the bank for paying forged checks after the time he should have given them notice. 4. R is authorized to draw on W, a bank, for any amount not exceeding 5,000 pesos. P makes a bill of exchange payable to his own order for 6,000 pesos by forging R's signature. P inders the bill to A, a holder in due course, who presented it for payment. After the bill had been cleared through W's clearing office, W paid the bill. Can W recover the amount paid to A? No, because W was guilty of gross negligence considering that the irregularity was apparent on the face of the bill. W is, therefore, precluded from setting up the question of forgery. 5. M. Maker, P. P. X endorses the note to A by forging P's signature. A endorses the note to B, B to C, C to D, the present holder. D can enforce the note against A, B, and C who are indorser subsequent to the forgery. As indorsers, they warrant that the instrument is genuine and in all respects what it purports to be. 6. P makes a bill of exchange payable to his own order by forging R's signature thereto as a drawer. The bill is addressed to W as drawee. On presentation for acceptance, W accepts the bill, see section 143. P then endorses the bill to A, A to B, B to C, C to D, the present holder. In this case, W cannot refuse to pay D on the ground that the signature of R was a forgery because by accepting the bill, he admits the genuineness of the drawer's signature, see section 62. Of course, W is not liable to P, the forger, and he can recover from him the money paid to D. 
neither is W liable to D if the latter had knowledge of the forgery or was guilty of negligence at the time he acquired the bill in not making inquiries which if made might have revealed the fact of forgery. Illustrative Cases One draw e-bank paid a check with name of drawer forged, although amount of check exceeds authorized limit. Fax, R is authorized to draw on W, a bank, for any amount not exceeding 5,000 pesos. P makes a bill of exchange payable to his own order for 6,000 pesos by forging R's signature. P enters the bill to A, a holder in due course, who presented it for payment. After the bill had been cleared through W's clearing office, W paid the bill. Issue, can W recover the amount paid to A? Held, no, because W was guilty of gross negligence considering that the irregularity was apparent on the face of the bill. W is, therefore, precluded from setting up the question of forgery. Two drawers negligence facilitated the encashment of forged checks and prevented the discovery of the fraud. Facts, during the months of March, April, and May 1969, 23 checks payable to various payees were prepared, processed, issued, and released by R, all of which were paid and cleared by PNB, and debited by W against R's account. During the same period of time, 23 checks bearing the same numbers as the aforementioned checks were likewise paid and cleared by W and debited against R's account. Investigation conducted by the NBI shows that the second 23 checks were deposited by three, three, fictitious payees and the fraudulent encashment was an inside job. Issue, is R barred from setting up the defense of forgery under section 23? Held, yes. R was guilty of negligence not only before the questioned checks were negotiated but even after the same were already negotiated as shown by the following. It used its own personalized checks, instead of the official PNB commercial blank checks without providing the needed security measures in the exercise of its special privilege in the printing of the same, example relative to the safekeeping and disposition of excess forms and spoiled check forms, paper used in printing said checks, supervision of the printing, and furnishing W with the print used by the printer, inks and pens in signing the checks, and other information regarding the same, and it failed to reconcile the bank statements with its own records which failure facilitated the fraudulent encashment. This negligence was the proximate cause of the failure to discover the fraud. 3. Draw e-bank allowed 27 days to elapse after clearing before notifying collecting bank as to forgery of payee's name. Facts, R drew a check on W, a bank, and in favor of P.S.P. The check fell into the hands of A who erased the name of P and put his name instead. A deposited the altered check in his name with B, a bank, which presented the check to W for clearing. The check was duly cleared by W and A, the forger, was credited the amount of the check. The alteration was discovered 27 days later and B was notified on the same day. Issue, is B liable to refund the amount of the check? Held, no. The court, relying on the doctrine announced in Republic of the Philippines v. Equitable Banking Corporation, held as decisive the fact that W allowed 27 days to elapse after clearing before notifying B as to such alteration. The applicable central bank provides for a 24-hour period only within which the draw e-bank must return a check to the collecting bank if the check is defective for any reason. Note, the validity of the 24-hour clearing hours regulation has been upheld in Republic v. Equitable Banking Corporation. The remedy of the draw e-bank is against the party responsible for the alteration. It is true that when an endorsement is forged, the collecting bank or last inducer, as a general rule, bears the loss, but the unqualified endorsement of the collecting bank on the check should be read together with the 24-hour regulation on clearing house operations. Once that 24-hour period is over, the liability of the collecting bank in such an endorsement has ceased. The clearing regulation in force when the dispute in Bank of the Philosophy Islands v. Court of Appeals occurred in November 12, 1981, forging of payee's endorsement, under Gearing House Rules and Regulations Philippine Clearing House Corporation, PCHC, as revised on September 19, 1980 provides. Items which have been the subject of material alteration or items bearing a forged endorsement when such endorsement is necessary for negotiation shall be returned within 24 hours after discovery of the alteration or the forgery, but in no event beyond the period prescribed by law for the filing of a legal action by the returning bank slash branch, institution, or entity against the bank slash branch, institution or entity sending the same. In the case of Banco de Oro Savings and Mortgage Bank versus Equitable Banking Corporation the clearing regulation, this is the present clearing regulation, at the time the party's dispute occurred was as follows. Section 21. 
items which have been the subject of material alteration or items bearing forged endorsement when such endorsement is necessary for negotiation shall be returned by direct presentation or demand to the presenting bank and not through the regular clearing house facilities within the period prescribed by law for the filing of a legal action by the returning bank slash branch, institution, or entity sending the same. The above cited clearing regulations are substantially the same in that it allows a return of a check bearing forged endorsement when such endorsement is necessary for negotiation even beyond the next regular clearing although not beyond the prescriptive period for the filing of a legal action by the returning bank. For depositor entrusted to his secretary who was able to encash and deposit to her personal account several checks against account of the depositor, his credit cards and checkbooks with blank checks. Facts, Petitioner R.I. was a depositor of good standing of respondent bank, MBC. As he was then running about 20 corporations, and was going out of the country a number of times, he entrusted to his security K, his credit cards and his checkbooks with blank checks. It was also K who verified and reconciled the statements of said checking account. K was able to encash and deposit to her personal account 17 checks drawn against the account of petitioner RI at the respondent bank. R.I. did not bother to check his statement of account until a business partner apprised him he saw K use RI's credit cards. R.I. requested MBC to credit back and restore to his account the value of the checks which were wrongfully encashed but MBC refused. Issue, is MBC liable for damages for its negligence in failing to detect the discrepant checks? Held, 1, Petitioner has no cause of action. To be entitled to damages, Petitioner has the burden of proving negligence on the part of the bank for failure to detect the discrepancy in the signatures on the checks. It is incumbent upon Petitioner to establish the fact of forgery, i.e., by submitting his specimen signatures and comparing them with those on the question checks. Curiously though, petitioner failed to submit additional specimen signatures as requested by the National Bureau of Investigation from which to draw a conclusive finding regarding forgery. The Court of Appeals found that petitioner, by his own inaction, was precluded from setting up forgery. 2. MBC Employees Exercise Due Diligence Petitioner's contention that Manila Bank MBC was remiss in the exercise of its duty as draw lacks factual basis. Consistently, the CA and the RDC found that Manila Bank employees exercised due diligence in cashing the checks. The bank's employees in the present case did not have a hint as to Eugenio's case modus operandi because she was a regular customer of the bank, having been designated by petitioner himself to transact in his behalf. According to the appellate court, the employees of the bank exercised due diligence in the performance of their duties. 3. Petitioner Negligent As borne by the records, it was petitioner, not the bank, who was negligent. Negligence is the omission to do something which a reasonable man, guided by those considerations which ordinarily regulate the conduct of human affairs, would do, or the doing of something which a prudent and reasonable man would do. In the present case, it appears that petitioner accorded his secretary unusual degree of trust and unrestricted access to his credit cards, passbooks, checkbooks, bank statements, including custody and possession of cancelled checks and reconciliation of accounts. 4. Petitioner failed to examine his bank statements. Petitioner's failure to examine his bank statements appears as the proximate cause of his own damage. Proximate cause is that cause, which, in natural and continuous sequence, unbroken by any efficient intervening cause, produces the injury, and without which the result would not have occurred. In the instant case, the bank was not shown to be remiss in its duty of sending monthly bank statements to petitioners so that any error or discrepancy in the entries therein could be brought to the bank's attention at the earliest opportunity. But, petitioner failed to examine these bank statements not because he was prevented by some cause in not doing so, but because he did not pay sufficient attention to the matter. Had he done so, he could have been alerted to any anomaly committed against him. In other words, petitioner had sufficient opportunity to prevent or detect any misappropriation by his secretary had he only reviewed the status of his accounts based on the bank statements sent to him regularly. In view of Article 2179 of the new civil code, when the plaintiff's own negligence was the immediate and proximate cause of his injury, no recovery could be had for damages. 5. Petitioner precluded from setting up forgery. The rule in section 23 does provide for an exception, namely, unless the party against whom it is sought to enforce such right is precluded from setting up the forgery or want of authority. In the instant case, it is the exception that applies. In our view, petitioner is precluded from setting up the forgery, assuming there is forgery, due to his own negligence in entrusting to his secretary his credit cards and checkbook including the verification of his statements of account. 6. 
fact of forgery not proved. Petitioner's reliance on Associated Bank v. Court of Appeals to buttress his contention that respondent Manila Bank as the collecting or last endorser generally suffers the loss because it has the duty to ascertain the genuineness of all prior endorsements is misplaced. In the cited cases, the fact of forgery was not an issue. In the present case, the fact of forgery was not established with certainty. In those cited cases, the collecting banks were held to be negligent for failing to observe precautionary measures to detect the forgery. In the case before us, both courts below uniformly found that Manila Bank's personnel diligently performed their duties, having compared the signature in the checks from the specimen signatures on record and satisfied themselves that it was petitioners. 5 Bank paid P950,000 upon a forged check payable to cash. Facts Plaintiff Samsung Construction Company Philippines Incorporated, Samsung Construction, while based in Binan, Laguna, maintained a current account with defendant Far East Bank and Trust Company, FEC, at the latter's Bel Air, Makati branch. The sole signatory to Samsung Construction's account was Zhang Q. Lee, Zhang, its project manager, while the checks remained in the custody of the company's accountant, Q. Yong Lee, Q. On March 19, 1992, a certain Roberto Gonzaga presented for payment FET check to the bank's branch in Bel Air, Makati. The check, payable to cash and drawn against Samsung Construction's current account, was in the amount of P999,500 pesos. The bank teller, CJ first checked the balance of Samsung Construction's account. After ascertaining there were enough funds to cover the check, she compared the signature appearing on the check with the specimen signature of Zhang as contained in the specimen signature card with the bank. After comparing the two signatures, CJ was satisfied as to the authenticity of the signature appearing on the check. She then asked Gonzaga to submit proof of his identity, and the latter presented three identification cards. At the same time, CJ forwarded the check to the branch senior assistant cashier GB, as it was bank policy that two bank branch officers approve checks exceeding 100, 000 pesos for payment or encashment. GV likewise counter-checked the signature on the check as against that on the signature card. He too concluded that the check was indeed signed by Zhang. GV then forwarded the check and signature card to SS, another bank officer, for approval. SS then noticed that Jose Sempio i.e., Sempio, the assistant accountant of Samsung Construction, was also in the bank. Sempio was well known to SS and the other bank officers, he being the assistant accountant of Samsung Construction. SS showed the check to Sempio, who vouched for the genuineness of Zhang's signature. Confirming the identity of Gonzaga, Sempio said that the check was for the purchase of equipment for Samsung Construction. Satisfied with the genuineness of the signature of Zhang, SS authorized the bank's encashment of the check to Gonzaga. The following day, the accountant of Samsung Construction, Q, examined the balance of the bank account and discovered that a check in the amount of 999,500 pesos had been encashed. Aware that he had not prepared such a check for Zhang's signature, Q perused the checkbook and found that the last blank check was missing. He reported the matter to Zhang, who then proceeded to the bank. Zhang learned of the encashment of the check, and realized that his signature had been forged. The bank manager reputedly told Zhang that he would be reimbursed for the amount of the check. Zhang proceeded to the police station and consulted with his lawyers. Subsequently, a criminal case for qualified theft was filed against Sempio before the Laguna Regional Trial Court. During the trial, both sides presented their respective expert witnesses to testify on the claim that Zhang's signature was forged. Samsung Corporation, which had referred the check for investigation to the NBI, presented senior NBI document examiner Rhoda Flores. She testified that based on her examination, she concluded that Zhang's signature had been forged on the check. On the other hand, FEC, which had sought the assistance of the Philippine National Police, PNP, presented Rosario Perez, a document examiner from the PNP Crime Laboratory. She testified that her findings showed that Zhang's signature on the check was genuine. Confronted with conflicting handwriting expert testimony of the NBI and the PNP, the RDC chose to believe the findings of the NBI expert that Zhang's signature had been forged on the check and accordingly directed the bank to pay or credit back to Samsung Construction's account the amount of 999,500 pesos, together with interest told from the time the complaint was filed, and attorney's fees in the amount of 15,000 pesos. The Court of Appeals reversed the RDC decision and absolved FET from any liability. Issue, who shall bear the loss? The draw e-bank or the drawer? One. Generally, 
a forged signature is wholly inoperative the general rule is to the effect that a forged signature is wholly inoperative, and payment made through or under such signature is ineffectual or does not discharge the instrument. If payment is made, the drawee cannot charge it to the drawer's account. The traditional justification for the result is that the drawee is in a superior position to detect a forgery because he has the maker's signature and is expected to know and compare it. The rule has a healthy cautionary effect on banks by encouraging care in the comparison of the signatures against those on the signature cards they have on file. Moreover, the very opportunity of the drawee to ensure and to distribute the cost among its customers who use checks makes the drawee an ideal party to spread the risk to insurance. Brady, in his treatise The Law of Forged and Altered Checks, elucidates. When a person deposits money in a general account in a bank, against which he has the privilege of drawing checks in the ordinary course of business, the relationship between the bank and the depositor is that of debtor and creditor. So far as the legal relationship between the two is concerned, the situation is the same as though the bank had borrowed money from the depositor, agreeing to repay it on demand, or had bought goods from the depositor, agreeing to pay for them on demand. The bank owes the depositor money in the same sense that any debtor owes money to his creditor. Added to this, in the case of bank and depositor, there is, of course, the bank's obligation to pay checks drawn by the depositor in proper form and presented in due course. When the bank receives the deposit, it impliedly agrees to pay only upon the depositor's order. When the bank pays a check, on which the depositor's signature is a forgery, it has failed to comply with its contract in this respect. Therefore, the bank is held liable. The fact that the forgery is a clever one is immaterial. The forged signature may so closely resemble the genuine as to defy detection by the depositor himself. And yet, if a bank pays the check, it is paying out its own money and not the depositor's. The forgery may be committed by a trusted employee or confidential agent the bank still must bear the loss. Even in a case where the forged check was drawn by the depositor's partner, the loss was placed upon the bank. The case referred to is Robinson v. Security Bank, in this case, the plaintiff brought suit against the defendant bank for money which had been deposited to the plaintiff's credit and which the bank had paid out on checks bearing forgeries of the plaintiff's signature. It was held that the bank was liable. It was further held that the fact that the plaintiff waited eight or nine months after discovering the forgery, before notifying the bank, did not, as a matter of law, constitute a ratification of the payment, so as to preclude the plaintiff from holding the bank liable. This rule of liability can be stated briefly in these words, a bank is bound to know its depositor's signature. The rule is variously expressed in the many decisions in which the question has been considered. But they all sum up to the proposition that a bank must know the signatures of those whose general deposits it carries. By no means is the principle rendered obsolete with the advent of modern commercial transactions. Contemporary texts still affirm this well-entrenched standard. Nichols, in his book Negotiable Instruments and Other Related Commercial Paper wrote, thus. The deposit contract between a payer bank and its customer determines who can draw against the customer's account by specifying whose signature is necessary on checks that are chargeable against the customer's account. Therefore, a check drawn against the account of an individual customer that is signed by someone other than the customer, and without authority from her, is not properly payable and is not chargeable to the customer's account, inasmuch as any unauthorized signature on an instrument is ineffective as the signature of the person whose name is signed. 2. Forgery is a real or absolute defuse. Under Section 23 of the Negotiable Instruments Law, forgery is a real or absolute defense by the party whose signature is forged. On the premise that Zhang's signature was indeed forged, Fetk is liable for the law since it authorized the discharge of the forged check. Such liability attaches even if the bank exerts due diligence and care in preventing such faulty discharge. Forgeries often deceive the eye of the most cautious experts, and when a bank has been so deceived, it is a harsh rule which compels it to suffer although. 1. Form and Interpretation No one has suffered by its being deceived. The forgery may be so near like the genuine as to defy detection by the depositor himself, and yet the bank is liable to the depositor if it pays the check. 3. Forgery duly proved. In ruling that forgery was not duly proven, the Court of Appeals held. There is ground to doubt the findings of the trial court sustaining the alleged forgery in view of the conflicting conclusions made by handwriting experts from the NBI and the PNP, both agencies of the government, these contradictory findings create doubt on whether there was indeed a forgery slash. This reasoning is pure sophistry. Any litigator worth his or her salt would never allow an opponent's expert witness to stand uncontradicted, thus the spectacle of competing expert witnesses is not unusual. 
the trier of fact will have to decide which version to believe, and explain why or why not such version is more credible than the other. Reliance therefore cannot be placed merely on the fact that there are colliding opinions of two experts, both clothed with the presumption of official duty, in order to draw a conclusion, especially one which is extremely crucial. Much is expected from the Court of Appeals as it occupies the penultimate tier in the judicial hierarchy. This court has long deferred to the appellate court as to its findings of fact in the understanding that it has the appropriate skill and competence to plow through the minutiae that scatters the factual field. In failing to thoroughly evaluate the evidence before it, and relying instead on presumptions haphazardly drawn, Die Court of Appeals was sadly remiss. On the other hand, the RDC did adjudge the testimony of the NBI expert as more credible than that of the PNP, and explained its reason behind the conclusion. The RDC was sufficiently convinced by the NBI examiner's testimony, and explained her reasons in its decisions. While the Court of Appeals disagreed and upheld the findings of the PNP, it failed to convincingly demonstrate why such findings were more credible than those of the NBI expert. As a throwaway, the assailed decision noted that the PNP, not the NBI, had the opportunity to examine the specimen signature card signed by Zhang, which was relied upon by the employees of FEC in authenticating Zhang's signature. The distinction is irrelevant in establishing forgery. Forgery can be established comparing the contested signatures as against those of any sample signature duly established as that of the persons whose signature was forged. FET lays undue emphasis on the fact that the PNP examiner did compare the question signature against the bank signature cards. The crucial fact in question is whether or not the check was forged, not whether the bank could have detected the forgery. The latter issue becomes relevant only if there is need to weigh the comparative negligence between the bank and the party whose signature was forged. 4. Petitioner's sole signatory disowned signature on check. At the same time, the Court of Appeals failed to assess die effect of Zhang's testimony that the signature on the check was not his. The assertion may seem self-serving at first blush, yet it cannot be ignored that Zhang was in the best position to know whether or not the signature on the check was his. While his claim should not be taken at face value, any averments he would have on the matter, if adjudged as truthful, deserve primacy in consideration. Zhang's testimony is supported by the findings of the NBI examiner. They are also backed by factual circumstances that support the conclusion that the assailed check was indeed forged. Judicial notice can be taken that is highly unusual in practice for a business establishment to draw a check for close to a million pesos and make it payable to cash or bearer, and not to order. Zhang immediately reported the forgery upon its discovery. He filed the appropriate criminal charges against Sempio, the putative forger. 5. Bank paid a forged check payable to cash. Petitioner is not precluded from setting up defense of forgery. The bare fact that the forgery was committed by an employee of the party whose signature was forged cannot necessarily imply that such party's negligence was the cause for the forgery. Employers do not possess the preternatural gift of cognition as to the evil that may lurk within the hearts and minds of their employees. The court's pronouncement in PCI Bank v. Court of Appeals applies in this case, to wit. T. He mere fact that the forgery was committed by a drawer payer's confidential employee or agent, who by virtue of his position had unusual facilities for perpetrating the fraud and imposing the forged paper upon the bank, does not entitle the bank to shift the loss to the drawer payer, in the absence of some circumstance raising estoppel against the drawer. Admittedly, the record does not clearly establish what measures Samsung Construction employed to safeguard its blank checks. Zhang did testify that his accountant, Q, kept the checks inside a safety box slash and no contrary version was presented by FEC. However, such testimony cannot prove that the checks were indeed kept in a safety box, as Zhang's testimony on that point is hearsay, since Q, and not Zhang, would have the personal knowledge as to how the checks were kept. Still, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, we can conclude that there was no negligence on Samsung Construction's particle. The presumption remains that every person takes ordinary care of his concerns, and that the ordinary course of business has been followed. Negligence is not presumed, but must be proven by him who alleges it. While the complaint was lodged at the instance of Samsung Construction, the matter it had to prove was the claim it had alleged, whether the check was forged. It cannot be required as well to prove that it was not negligent, because the legal presumption remains that ordinary care was employed. Thus, it was incumbent upon FEC, in defense, to prove the negative fact that Samsung construction was negligent. While the payee, as in this case, may not have the personal knowledge as to the standard procedures observed by the drawer, it well has the means of disputing the presumption of regularity. Proving a negative fact may be a difficult office, but necessarily so, 
as it seeks to overcome a presumption in law. Feck was unable to dispute the presumption of ordinary care exercised by Samsung Construction, hence we cannot agree with the Court of Appeals finding of negligence. 6. Generally, Drahi bears loss from payment of forged check. The assailed decision replicated the extensive efforts which FET devoted to establish that there was no negligence on the part of the bank in its acceptance and payment of the forged check. However, the degree of diligence exercised by the bank would be irrelevant if the drawer is not precluded from setting up the defense of forgery under Section 23 by his own negligence. The rule of equity enunciated in PNB v. National City Bank of New York, as relied upon by the Court of Appeals, deserves careful examination. The point in issue has sometimes been said to be that of negligence. The drawee who has paid upon forged signature is held to bear the loss, because he has been negligent in failing to recognize that the handwriting is not that of his customer. But it follows obviously that if the payee, holder, or presenter of the forged paper has himself been in default, if he has himself been guilty of a negligence prior to that of the banker, or if by any act of his own he has at all contributed to induce the banker's negligence, then he may lose his right to cast the loss upon the banker. Emphasis supplied. Quite palpably, the general rule remains that the drawee who has paid upon the forged signature bears the loss. The exception to this rule arises only when negligence can be traced on the part of the drawer whose signature was forged, and the need arises to weigh the comparative negligence between the drawer and the drawee to determine who should bear the burden of loss. The court finds no basis to conclude that Samsung construction was negligent in the safekeeping of its checks. For one, the settled rule is that the mere fact that the depositor leaves his checkbook lying around does not constitute such negligence as will free the bank from liability to him, where a clerk of die depositor or other persons, taking advantage of the opportunity, abstracts some of the check blanks, forges the depositor's signature and collect on the checks from the bank. 62 And for another, in point of fact Samsung construction was not negligent at all since it reported the forgery almost immediately upon discovery. 7 distinction between forgery of signature of drawer and of indicer. It is also worth noting that the forged signatures in PNB v. National City Bank of New York were not of the drawer, but of indicers. The same circumstance attends PNB v. Court of Appeals, which was also cited by the Court of Appeals. It is accepted that a forged signature of the drawer differs in treatment than a forged signature of the indicer. The justification for the distinction between forgery of the signature of the drawer and forgery of an endorsement is that the drawee is in a position to verify the drawer's signature by comparison with one in his hands, but has ordinarily no opportunity to verify an endorsement. Thus, a drawee bank is generally liable to its depositor in paying a check which bears either a forgery of the drawer's signature or a forged endorsement. But the bank may, as a general rule, recover back the money which it has paid on a check bearing a forged endorsement, whereas it has not this right to the same extent with reference to a check bearing a forgery of the drawer's signature. The general rule imputing liability on the drawee who paid out on the forgery holds in this case. 8. Bank itself remiss in its duty. Since FET puts into issue the degree of care it exercised before paying out on the forged check, we might as well comment on the bank's performance of its duty. It might be so that the bank complied with its own internal rules prior to paying out on the questionable check. Yet, there are several troubling circumstances that lead us to believe that the bank itself was remiss in its duty. The fact that the check was made out in the amount of nearly 1 million pesos is unusual enough to require a higher degree of caution on the part of the bank. Indeed, FET confirms this through its own internal procedures. Checks below P25,000.00 require only the approval of the teller, those between P25,000.00 to P100,000.00 necessitate the approval of one bank officer, and should the amount exceed P100,000.00 the concurrence of two bank officers is required. In this case, not only did the amount in the check nearly total 1 million pesos, it was also payable to cash. That latter circumstance should have aroused the suspicion of the bank, as it is not ordinary business practice for a check for such large amount to be made payable to cash or to bearer, instead of to the order of a specified person. Moreover, the check was presented for payment by one Roberto Gonzaga, who was not designated as the payee of the check, and who did not carry with him any written proof that he was authorized by Samsung Construction to encash the check. Gonzaga, a stranger to FEC, was not even an employee of Samsung Construction. These circumstances are already suspicious if taken independently, much more so if they are evaluated in concurrence. 112. The Negotiable Instruments Law. Section 23. Given the shoddiness attending Gonzaga's presentment of the check, 
it was not sufficient for FET to have merely complied with its internal procedures, but mandatory that all earnest efforts be undertaken to ensure the validity of the check, and of the authority of Gonzaga to collect payment therefore. According to FET senior assistant cashier Gemma Valles, the bank tried, but failed, to contact Zhang over the phone to verify the check. She added that calling the issuer or drawer of the check to verify the same was not part of the standard procedure of the bank, but an extra effort. Even assuming that such personal verification is tantamount to extraordinary diligence, it cannot be denied that FEC still paid out the check despite the absence of any proof of verification from the drawer. Instead, the bank seems to have relied heavily on the say-so of Sempio, who was present at the bank at the time the check was presented. Even assuming that FEC had a standing habit of dealing with Sempio, Acting in behalf of Samsung Construction, the irregular circumstances attending the presentment of the forged check should have put the bank on the highest degree of alert. The court recently emphasized that the highest degree of care and diligence is required of banks. 9. Banks' business impressed with public interest. Banks are engaged in a business impressed with public interest, and it is their duty to protect in return their many clients and depositors who transact business with them. They have the obligation to treat their client's account meticulously and with the highest degree of care, considering the fiduciary nature of their relationship. The diligence required of banks, therefore, is more than that of a good father of a family. Given the circumstances, extraordinary diligence dictates that Fett should have ascertained from Zhang personally that the signature in the questionable check was his. Since the drawer, Samsung Construction, is not precluded by negligence from setting up the forgery, the general rule should apply. Consequently, if a bank pays a forged check, it must be considered as paying out of its funds and cannot charge the amount so paid to the account of the depositor. A bank is liable, irrespective of its good faith, in paying a forged check. Right of drawee to recover payment made where? Drawer's signature was forged. Has the drawee of a bill of exchange the right to recover a payment which he has made to a holder in due course of a bill on which the signature of the drawer was forged? The rule adopted and followed in almost all American jurisdictions as the doctrine of Price versus Neal is that as between equally innocent persons, the drawee who pays money on a check or draft the signature on which was forged cannot recover the money from the one who received it. Acceptance prior to payment is not a prerequisite to the rule, and the rule applies alike where payment is received without prior acceptance and where it is paid after acceptance. 1. Rule founded on estoppel and principle of natural justice. The grounds given for the rule include estoppel, actual or presumed negligence of the drawee of not detecting the forgery, and the principle of natural justice that as between two persons, one of whom must suffer, the legal title shall prevail. At any rate, the rule is based upon the obligation of the drawee to know the signature of the drawer and the presumption is that he does. It is impracticable for the endorsee or holder of a bill or check to know or learn whether the signature of the drawer is genuine but the drawee, particularly a bank as it keeps a record in which are preserved the genuine signatures of its depositors, customers, and correspondents, has the best means of knowing or learning the fact. This inequality of footing between the drawee and the holder furnishes the justification for the rule placing the onus on the drawee. 2. Rule founded on ground of public policy It is also declared that the rule is one of policy of maintaining confidence in the security of negotiable paper by making the time and place of acceptance or payment the time and place for the final settlement, as between the drawer and the holder, of the question of the genuineness of the drawer's signature. 3. Responsibility of drawee bank. It is a fundamental rule of banking that when a bank receives money to be checked out by a depositor, it is to be paid only as the depositor shall order. The bank assumes this duty in receiving the deposit. If, therefore, it pays out money otherwise than according to such order it is liable to the depositor for the amount so paid. The bank thus assumes the responsibility of seeing that the money gets to the party authorized to receive it. Hence, if it pays money out on forged signature the depositor being free from blame or negligence, it must bear the loss. But where the payee was not a client of the respondent bank, i.e., did not maintain an account in said bank, and the latter, therefore, had no way of ascertaining the authenticity of the payee's endorsements on all checks which were deposited in the accounts of the defendants in said bank, the bank cannot be held negligent where, in accordance with banking practice, it caused the checks to pass through the clearing house before it allowed their proceeds to be withdrawn by the defendants. 4. Allocation of loss between drawee bank and collecting bank. In a case where both the drawee bank and the representing or collecting bank were guilty of negligence resulting in the encashment of forged checks, the Supreme Court allocated the loss and the costs of arbitration proceedings and litigation on a 60 to 40 ratio considering the comparative negligence of the two banks. Illustrative Cases 
One draw e-bank seeks a refund of the amount of check with signatures of drawers officers forged, from collecting bank which guaranteed all prior endorsements. Fax, a check, purporting to have been drawn by the GSIS upon PNB, bank, named P as payee who purportedly interested to A and from A to B, who, in turn, deposited it with PCIB, bank, which stamped the following on the back of the check, a prior endorsements and slash or lack of endorsements guaranteed, PCIB. On the same date, PCIB sent the check to PNB for clearance. PNB retained the check and paid its amount to PCIB, as well as debited it against the account of GSIS. Subsequently, upon demand by GSIS, PNB recredited the former's account for the reason that the signatures of the GSIS's officers were forged. Issue, is PNB entitled to a refund of the amount of the check from PCIB? Held, no. 1. Forgery immaterial to PNB's liability. Even assuming that the endorsements of the supposed indicers are forged, the forgery is immaterial to PNB's liability as drawee or to its right to recover from PCIB, for, as against the drawee, the endorsement of an intermediate bank does not guarantee the signature of the drawer, since the forgery of the endorsement is not the cause of the loss. 2. Guarantee of PCIB not as to signatures on check. PCIB guaranteed all prior endorsements, not the authenticity of the signatures of the officers of the GSIS who signed on its behalf, because GSIS is not the indicer of the check but its drawer. Said warranty is irrelevant, therefore, to PNB's alleged right to recover from PCIB. It could have been availed of by a subsequent endorsee, or a holder in due course subsequent to PCIB. Neither is PNB. Indeed, upon payment by the PNB, as drawee, the check ceased to be a negotiable instrument, and became a mere voucher or proof of payment. 3. PNB proximate cause of the loss. Furthermore, by not returning the check to PCIB, thereby indicating that PNB had found nothing wrong with the check, and honoring the same, and by actually paying its amount to PCIB, PNB induced the latter to believe that the check was genuine and good in every respect and to pay its amount to B. In other words, PNB was the primary or proximate cause of the loss, and hence, may not recover from PCIB. Then, again, the rule is that where the collecting, PCIB, and the drawee, PNB, banks are equally at fault, the court will leave the parties where it finds them. Two depositor seeks the return by a bank to his account of amount debited under a stolen check as his signature on the check was forged. Fax, R. brought X, a classmate and friend whom he trusted, along in his car to a bank, PNB, and he left his personal belongings in the car. X asterisk removed and stole a check from R's checkbook without the knowledge and consent of the latter. X filled up the check up to the amount of 5,000 pesos, forged the signature of R and N cashed the check in the bank on the same day. The account of R was debited the same amount. R asked the bank the said amount should be returned to his account as his signature on the check was forged. Issue, under the circumstances of the case, was R negligent? Held, no. He could not have been expected to know that X would remove a check from, his checkbook. The prime duty of a bank is to ascertain the genuineness of the signature of the drawer or depositor of the check being encashed. It is expected to use reasonable business prudence in accepting and cashing a check presented to it. This rule is absolutely necessary to the circulation of drafts and checks, and is based on the presumed negligence of the drawee in failing to meet its obligation to know the signature of its depositor. There is nothing inequitable in such a rule. If the paper comes to the drawee in the regular course of business, and he, having the opportunity of ascertaining its character, pronounces it to be valid and pays it, it is not only a question of payment under mistake, but payment in neglect of duty which the law places upon him, and the result of his negligence must rest upon him. It is not a defense that the check in question had to pass scrutiny by a signature verifier as well as an officer of the bank. In the case at bar, the trial court found that a comparison of the signature on the forged check and the sample signatures of R showed marked differences. Note, a drawee is not precluded from recovery of a payment which was conditional only, see section 62, that is, if an instrument is paid subject to later examination which discloses the forgery. Three bank allowed a depositor to withdraw from the proceeds of the treasury warrants deposited with the former, even before the said warrants had been cleared. Fax, G opened an account with GSAL, a savings and loan association, and deposited over a period of two months 38 treasury warrants drawn by a government agency with a total value of more than 1.7 million. Six of these were directly payable to G while the others appear to have been indexed by their respective payees, 
followed by G as second inducer. The warrants were subsequently induced by C, cashier of GSAL, and deposited to GSAL savings account with a branch of MVTC, bank, which forwarded them to the Bureau of Treasury for special clearing. In the meantime, G was not allowed to withdraw from his account. After more than two weeks, exasperated overseas repeated inquiries as to whether the warrants had been cleared and also as an accommodation for a valued client, MBTC finally decided to allow GSAL to withdraw from the proceeds of the warrants. In turn, GSAL subsequently allowed G to make withdrawals from his own account. Later, MBTC informed GSAL that 32 of the warrants had been dishonored by the Bureau of Treasury and demanded the refund of the amount GSAL has previously withdrawn, to make up the deficit in its account. Issue, was MBTC negligent in giving GSAL the impression that the Treasury warrants had been cleared and that consequently, it was safer to allow G to withdraw the proceeds thereof from his account with it? Held, 1, MBTC guilty of negligence. A. MBTC was indeed negligent in giving GSAL the impression that the Treasury warrants had been cleared and that, consequently, it was safe to allow G to withdraw the proceeds thereof from his account with it. Without such assurance, GSAL would not have allowed the withdrawals, with such assurance, there was no reason not to allow the withdrawal. Indeed, GSAL might even have incurred liability for its refusal to return the money that to all appearances belonged to the depositor, who could, therefore, withdraw at any time and for any reason he saw fit. It was, in fact, to secure the clearance of the Treasury warrants that GSAL deposited them to its account with MBTC. 144 The Negotiable Instruments Law Section 23 GSAL had no clearing facilities of its own. It relied on MBTC to determine the validity of the warrants through its own services. The proceeds of the warrants were withheld from G until MBTC allowed GSAL itself to withdraw them from its own deposit. It was only when MBTC gave the go signal that G was finally allowed by GSAL to withdraw them from his own account. 2. GSAL acted with due care and diligence. The argument of MBTC that GSAL should have exercised more care in checking the personal circumstances of G before accepting his deposit does not hold water. It was G who was entrusting the warrants, not GSAL that was extending him a loan, and moreover, the treasury warrants were subject to clearing, pending which the depositor could not withdraw its proceeds. There was no question of G's identity or of the genuineness of his signature as checked by GSAL. In fact, the treasury warrants were dishonored allegedly because of the forgery of the signatures of the drawers, not of G as payee or inducer. Under the circumstances, it is clear that GSAL acted with due care and diligence and cannot be faulted for the withdrawals it allowed G to make slash. 3. MBTC liable as agent. To gloss over its carelessness, MBTC would invoke the conditions printed on the dorsal side of the deposit slips through which the treasury warrants were deposited by GSAL with its Calipan branch. The conditions read as follows. Kindly note that in receiving items on deposit, the bank obligates itself only as the depositor's collecting agent, assuming no responsibility beyond care in selecting correspondence, and until such time as actual payment shall have come into possession of this bank, the right is reserved to charge back to the depositor's account any amount previously credited, whether or not such item is returned. This also applies to checks drawn on local banks and bankers and their branches as well as on this bank, which are unpaid due to insufficiency of funds, forgery, unauthorized overdraft, or any other reason. Italics supplied. According to MBTC, the said conditions clearly show that it was acting only as a collecting agent for GSAL and give it the right to charge back to the depositor's account any amount previously credited, whether or not such item is returned. This. Section 23. Negotiable Instruments in General. I form an interpretation. 119. Also applies to checks, which are unpaid due to insufficiency of funds, forgery, unauthorized overdraft of any other reason. It is claimed that the said conditions are in the nature of contractual stipulations and became binding on GSAL when C, as its cashier, signed the deposit slips. In stressing that it was acting only as a collecting agent for GSAL, MBTC seems to be suggesting that as a mere agent it cannot be liable to the principal. This is not exactly true. On the contrary, Article 1909 of the Civil Code clearly provides that. Article 1909. The agent is responsible not only for fraud, but also for negligence, which shall be judged with more or less rigor by the courts, according to whether the agency was or was for a compensation. The negligence of MBTC has been sufficiently established. 
To repeat for emphasis, it was the clearance given by it that assured GSAL it was already safe to allow G to withdraw the proceeds of the treasury warrants he had deposited. MBTC misled GSAL. It allowed GSAL to withdraw from its account not only once or even twice but three times. The total withdrawal was in excess of its original balance before the treasury warrants were deposited, which only added to its belief that the treasury warrants had indeed been cleared. MBTC's argument that it may recover the disputed amount if the warrants are not paid for any reason is not acceptable. Any reason does not mean no reason at all. Otherwise, there would have been no need at all for GSAL to deposit the treasury warrants with it for clearance. There would have been no need for it to wait until the warrants had been cleared before paying the proceeds thereof to G. Such a condition, if interpreted in the way the MBTC suggests, is not binding for being arbitrary and unconscionable and it becomes more so in the case at bar when it is considered that the supposed dishonor of the warrants was not communicated to GSAL before it made its own payment to G. 4. Treasury Warrants in Question Not Negotiable Instruments A no less important consideration is the circumstance that the Treasury Warrants in Question are not negotiable instruments. Clearly stamped on their face is the word non-negotiable. Moreover, and this is of equal significance, it is indicated that they are payable from a particular fund, to wit, Fund 501. CC's LB, 3, last PAR. The indication of Fund 501 as the source of the payment to be made on the Treasury warrants makes the order or promise to pay not unconditional and the warrants themselves non negotiable. MBTC cannot contend that by indexing the warrants in general, GSAL assumed that they were genuine and in all respects what they purport to be, in accordance with Section 66. The simple reason is that this law is not applicable to the non negotiable Treasury warrants. The endorsement was made by C not for the purpose of guaranteeing the genuineness of the warrants but merely to deposit them with MBTC for clearing. It was in fact MBTC that made the guarantee when it stamped on the back of the warrants, all prior endorsements and slash or lack of endorsements guaranteed, MBTC, Calipan branch. MBTC lays heavy stress on JLI Corporation versus Bank of the Philippine Islands. This case is inapplicable. That case involved checks whereas this case involves treasury warrants. GSAL never represented that the warrants were negotiable but signed them only for the purpose of depositing them for clearance. Also, the fact of forgery was proved in that case but not in this case. Finally, the court found the JLI Corporation negligent in accepting the checks without question from one Antonio Ramirez notwithstanding that the payee was the Inter-Island Gas Services Incorporated and it did not appear that he was authorized to endorse it. No similar negligence can be imputed to GSAL. The total value of the 32 Treasury warrants dishonored was 1,754,089 pesos from which G was allowed to withdraw 1,167,500 pesos before GSAL was notified of the dishonor. The amount G has withdrawn must be charged not to GSAL but MBTC, which must bear the consequences of its own negligence. Right of draw E to recover payment where payees or endorsee's signature was forged. 1. From the encasher or last endorser. It is not supposed to be the duty of the draw e-bank of a check to ascertain whether the signatures of the payee or indicers are genuine or not. This is because the indicer is supposed to warrant to the draw e that the signatures of the payee and previous indicers are genuine, warranty not extending only to holders in due course. One who purchases a check or draft is bound to satisfy himself that the paper is genuine and that by indicing it or presenting it for payment or putting it into circulation before presentation, he impliedly asserts that he has performed his duty and the drawee who has paid the forged check, without actual negligence of his part, may recover the money from such negligent purchasers. In such case, the recovery is permitted because although the drawee was in a way negligent in failing to detect the forgery, yet, if the encasher of the check had performed his duty, the forgery would, in all probability, have been detected and the fraud defeated. The reason for allowing the drawee bank to recover from the encasher is, Everyone with even the least experience in business knows that no businessman would accept a check in exchange for money or goods unless he is satisfied that the check is genuine. He accepts it only because he has proofs that it is genuine, or because he has sufficient confidence in the honesty and financial responsibility of the person who vouches for it. If he is deceived, he has suffered a loss of his cash or goods through his own mistake. His own credulity or recklessness, or misplaced confidence was the sole cause of the loss. Why should he be permitted to shift the loss due to his own fault in assuming the risk, upon the drawee, simply because of the accidental circumstance that the drawee afterwards failed to detect the forgery when the check was presented? 2. From the drawer or depositor. As a rule, 
a drawee bank who has paid a check on which an endorsement has been forged cannot debit or charge the drawer's account for the amount of said check and is not entitled to indemnification from the drawer. The risk of loss must perforce fall on the drawee bank. An exception to this rule is where the drawer is guilty of such negligence which causes the bank to honor such a check or checks. If a check is stolen from the payee, it is quite obvious that the drawer cannot possibly discover the forged endorsement by mere examination of his cancelled check. This accounts for the rule that although a depositor owes a duty to his drawee bank to examine his cancelled checks for forgery of his own signature, he has no similar duty as to forged endorsements. A different situation arises where the endorsement was forged by an employee or agent of the drawer, or done with the active participation of the latter. Most of the cases involving forgery by an agent or employee deal with the payee's endorsement. The drawer and the payee oftentimes have business relations of long standing. The continued occurrence of business transactions of the same nature provides the opportunity for the agent slash employee to commit the fraud after having developed familiarity with the signatures of the parties. However, sooner or later, some leak will show on the drawer's books. It will then be just a question of time until the fraud is discovered. This is especially true when the agent perpetrates a series of forgeries. The negligence of a depositor which will prevent recovery of an unauthorized payment is based on failure of the depositor to act as a prudent businessman would under the circumstances. In the above cited case, the petitioner relied implicitly upon the honesty and loyalty of her bookkeeper, and did not even verify the accuracy of the amounts of the checks she signed against the invoices attached thereto. Furthermore, although she regularly received her bank statements, she apparently did not carefully examine the same nor the check stubs and the returned checks, and did not compare them with the sales invoices. Otherwise, she could have easily discovered the discrepancies between the checks and the documents serving as basis for the checks. With such discovery, the subsequent forgeries would not have been accomplished. It was not until two years after her bookkeeper commenced her fraudulent scheme that petitioner discovered that 82 checks were wrongfully charged to her account, at which time she notified the respondent draw e bank. A depositor may not sit idly by, after knowledge has come to her that her funds seem to be disappearing or that there may be a leak in her business, and refrain from taking the steps that a careful and prudent businessman would take in such circumstances and if taken, would result in stopping the continuance of the fraudulent scheme. If she fails to take such steps, the facts may establish her negligence and, in that event, she would be a stop from recovering from the bank. If at the same time the draw e-bank was also negligent to the point of substantially contributing to the loss, then such loss from the forgery can be apportioned between the drawer and the drawee. Rights of parties in cases of forged endorsements. 1. Where note payable to order. Where the note is payable to order, the party whose endorsement is forged is not liable to any holder ever a holder in due course. The endorsement, being forged, is inoperative. The other parties, including the maker, prior to the party whose signature is forged are also not liable to any holder. The instrument being payable to order, it can be negotiated only by endorsement completed by delivery. But since the endorsement is forged, it is inoperative and, therefore, it cannot operate to transfer any right or title over the instrument. Example. M makes a note payable to P or order. P endorses the note to A X finds it. X endorses the note to B forging A's signature thereto. A, A, whose endorsement is forged, is not liable to B, whether B is a holder in due course or not. Being forged, the endorsement is wholly inoperative. B, M and P, parties prior to A, whose signature is forged, are not also liable to B. The endorsement of the note by A together with the delivery of the same, is the only means through which B could acquire any right against M and P under the instrument. But since the endorsement is forged, it is inoperative. Consequently, no rights can be enforced by virtue of such instrument. 2. Where note payable to bearer. Where the note, mechanically complete, is originally payable to bearer, the party whose endorsement is forged is liable to a holder in due course, but not to one who is not a holder in due course. The other parties, including the maker, prior to the party whose signature is forged, may also be held liable by one who is not a holder in due course. The reason is that the instrument being originally payable to bearer, it can be negotiated by mere delivery. Section 30. In other words, endorsement is not necessary to the title of the holder. Hence, even if the endorsement is forged, the forgery may be disregarded. The forged endorsement does not prevent the transfer of title since the holder may just strike out the forged endorsement. Section 48. The only defense available is want of delivery but this defense can be raised only against a holder not in due course. 
Example. Suppose in the preceding example, the note is payable to bearer on its face and it is delivered by M to P, who endorsed it to A. The note is found by X and is endorsed by him to B by forging A's signature. B endorses the note to C who, in turn, delivers without endorsement the note to D, a holder in due course. In this case, the endorsement of P, A, and B are not necessary to vest ownership in the note to D being originally payable to bearer, mere delivery is sufficient. Hence, even if the endorsement of A is forged, A can be held liable to D. For the same reason, M, the maker, and P, a party prior to A, whose signatures is forged, can also be held liable to D. D may just strike out the forged endorsement of A of course, D can enforce the note against B and C who are liable tender their warranties as indicers. 3. Where bill payable to order. Where the bill is payable to order, the party whose endorsement is forged, is not liable to any holder even a holder in due course. The forged endorsement is wholly inoperative. A. Where the signature of the payee was forged, the collecting bank is liable to the payee and must bear the loss because it is its legal duty to ascertain that the payee's endorsement was genuine before cashing the check. As a general rule, a bank or corporation who has obtained possession of a check upon an unauthorized or forged endorsement of the payee's signature and who collects the amount of the check from the drawee, is liable for the proceeds thereof to the payee or other owner, notwithstanding that the amount has been paid to the person from whom the check was obtained. The theory of the rule is that the possession of a check on a forged or unauthorized endorsement is wrongful, and when the money is collected on the check, the bank can be held liable for the amount had and received. The proceeds are held for the rightful owner of the payment and may be recovered by him. The position of the bank taking the check is the same as if it had taken the check and collected without endorsement at all. The act of the bank amounts to conversion of the check. The liability of the bank to the payee for the value of the check attaches whether or not the bank was aware of the forged or unauthorized endorsement. In Westmont Bank, petitioner claims that since there was no delivery yet and respondent has never acquired possession of the checks, respondent's remedy is with the drawer and not with petitioner bank. Petitioner relies on the view to the effect that where there is no delivery to the payee and no title vests in him, he ought not to be allowed to recover on the ground that he lost nothing because he never became the owner of the check and still retained his claim of debt against the drawer. However, another view in certain cases holds that even if the absence of delivery is considered, such consideration is not material. The rationale for this view is that in said cases the plaintiff uses one action to reach, by a desirable shortcut, the person who ought in any event to be ultimately liable as among the innocent persons involved in the transaction. In other words, the payee ought to be allowed to recover directly from the collecting bank, regardless of whether the check was delivered to the payee or not. Petitioner could not escape liability for its negligent act. b. If the drawee pays under a forged endorsement, the drawer is not liable on the bill and the drawee may not debit the drawer's account. If it does, it shall have to recredit the amount of the check to the account of the drawer. A bank is bound to know the signature of its customers, drawers, and if it pays a forged check it must be considered as making the payment out of its own funds and cannot ordinarily charge the amount so paid to the account of the depositor, see section 189, whose name was forged. In a checking transaction, the drawee bank has the duty to verify the genuineness of the drawer's signature and to pay the check strictly in accordance with the drawer's instructions. While the drawee bank may not debit the account of the drawer, it may generally pass liability back through the collection chain to the party who took from the forger and, of course, to the forger himself. See, where, however, the checks are received merely for collection and deposit, the bank, as agent, cannot be expected to know or ascertain the genuineness of all prior endorsements. But by stamping on checks accepted by it for deposit it's guarantee that all prior endorsements and slash or lack of endorsements guaranteed, a collecting slash presenting bank thereby makes the assurance that it has ascertained the genuineness of all prior endorsements. D. So even if the endorsement on the check deposited by the collecting bank's client is forged, the collecting bank is bound by its warranties as an indicer and cannot set up the defense of forgery as against the drawee bank. The principle of estoppel prevents the collecting bank from denying liability. The drawee of a check can recover from the holder the money paid to him on a forged endorsement. E. Apropos the matter of forgery in endorsements, the collecting bank, or last indicer generally suffers the loss because it has the duty to ascertain the genuineness of all prior endorsements considering that the act of presenting the check for payment to the drawee is an assertion that the party making the presentment has done its duty to ascertain the genuineness of the endorsements. F. The collecting bank has privity with its depositors who are its clients. Furthermore, 
it is also in a better position to detect forgery, fraud, or irregularity in the endorsement. If the drawee bank discovers that the signature of the payee was forged after it has cleared the check and paid the amount of the check to the holder thereof, it can recover the amount paid from the collecting bank as it has no right to be paid, without prejudice to the latter proceeding against the forger. Even if the collecting bank was not negligent, it would still be liable to the drawee bank because of its endorsement. The drawee bank is not similarly situated as the collecting bank because the former makes no warranty as to the genuineness of any endorsement. Its duty is but to verify the genuineness of the drawer's signature and not of the endorsement because the drawer is its client. G. The drawee bank must be free of any negligence in failing to discover the alteration or forgery in order that it may claim reimbursement from the collecting bank. It has the duty to promptly inform the presenter of the forgery upon discovery, otherwise, it forfeits its right to reimbursement if the delay deprives the drawee bank of the opportunity to go after the forger. H where the drawer of a check delivers it to an imposter mistakenly believing him to be the payee named in the check, the endorsement of the check by the imposter is not a forgery, and the drawer is liable to a bona fide holder or any subsequent indicer who may be compelled to pay it. Examples 1. An insurance company drew a check for 2,000 pesos on H&S Bank payable to the order of PX fraudulently obtained possession of the check and forged P's signature as an indicer and then personally indexed and deposited the check with PN Bank which honored the check and placed the amount thereof to his credit. The next day, PN Bank indexed the check to H&S Bank, the drawee bank, which paid it and charged the amount of the check to the account of the insurance company, the drawer. The rights and liabilities of the parties are as follows. A. H&S Bank, drawee, is liable to the insurance company, drawer, for the amount of the check and its account may not be debited with the said amount for the reason that the endorsement of P, the payee, being forged, it is wholly inoperative and H&S Bank has no right to pay it. B, the PN Bank is liable to H&S Bank under the warranties of an indicer. Section 66. The PN Bank with which the check was deposited has no right to pay the sum stated therein to the forger, X or anyone else upon a forged signature. It was its legal duty to know that P's endorsement was genuine before cashing the check. It shall, therefore, suffer the loss. C. The PN Bank's remedy is against X, forger, to whom it paid the money. D. X, the forger, is liable both criminally and civilly for the forgery. E. P, the payee, is not liable on the check his endorsement being forged, it is wholly inoperative. He can demand another check from the drawer and demand payment from the drawee. F. The insurance company is not liable on the check because its order is to pay the amount thereof to P or his order. And not to any other persons. Note, the doctrine in this case is not applicable to the Jempiza case because in said case, the check was fraudulently taken and the signature of the payee was forged not by an agent or employee of the drawer. The drawer was not found to be negligent in the handling of its business affairs and the theft of the check by a total stranger was not attributable to negligence of the drawer, neither was the forging of the payee's endorsement due to the drawer's negligence. Since the drawer was not negligent, the drawee was duty-bound to restore to the drawer's account the amount theretofore paid under the check with a forged payee's endorsement because the drawee did not pay as ordered by the drawer. 2. Are issued 10 checks, 2 of 3 crossed checks, see section 185, are bearer checks and one uncrossed bearer check payable to P Incorporated X, a sales agent of P Incorporated, indexed all the checks to a corp which deposited the same in its current amount with Bank of PI. After temporarily crediting the amount thereof to a corp's account Bank of PI debited the amount against the account of a corp upon being informed by P Incorporated that the endorsements by X were forgeries. Has Bank of PI the right to debit a corp's current account in the amount corresponding to the total value of the checks in question? Yes. A. As indicer, considering that it indexed the checks when it deposited them, a corp warrants that every single one of those checks is genuine and in all aspects what it purports to be. b. As a mere agent for collection and deposit, Bank of PI cannot be expected to know or ascertain the genuineness of all prior endorsements on the paid checks. Note, in the JLI Corp case, the Supreme Court cited the ruling in the Great Eastern Life INS Co case in holding that a corp must in turn shoulder the loss of the amounts which Bank of PI, as its collecting agent, had to reimburse to the draw e-banks. The qualification made in the JLI Corp case with respect to the liability of a bank acting as a mere agent for collection, C2, B, does not apply as regards the draw e-banks to which Bank of PI voluntarily paid the value of the checks returned by them to it. Bank of PI is liable as indicer to the draw e-banks, and a corp is, in turn, liable to Bank of PI. 3. 
a back pay check was issued by the Bureau of Treasury payable to P endorsements are from P to A, then to B, next to C, the last endorser, who encashed the check at W Bank. The endorsement of P was forged. A. The negotiation from P to A is of no effect, but the endorsements from A to B and from B to C are valid and enforceable as the signatures thereto are genuine. Section 23. B. The drawee bank can recover from C the money he received for the check as endorser. C warrants to W Bank that the previous endorsements were genuine. 4. Where bill payable to bearer. In case the bill is originally payable to bearer, die drawee may debit the drawer's account in spite of the forged endorsement. The reason is that the forged endorsement is not necessary to the title of the holder. The drawee cannot recover from the holder. Example. Supposing that the check drawn by the insurance company is originally a bearer one, H&S Bank may charge the amount thereof to the account of the insurance company. In this case, the drawee, H&S Bank, would not be able to recover from the holder, P&N Bank, of the bearer bill since the forged endorsement of P by X did not prevent the transfer of title. The remedy of the drawer insurance company is against X, the forger. Of course, P, the payee, is not bound not having received the amount of the check and not having endorsed the same. It must be remembered that all the foregoing are qualified in those cases where there is estoppel against the party desiring to set up the defense of forgery.